Hey folks, sorry there has not been much activity on my channel recently. I hope to get back in the saddle with this response to popular YouTube atheist Rationality Rules and his video titled, You Can't Prove That God Doesn't Exist, debunked. It's often said by skeptics and scientists that you can't prove a negative. Uh, no, scientists don't often say you can't prove a negative, or at least not in their capacity as scientists, because it's not a scientific claim. And if they do say it, they're just as philosophically illiterate as the village atheists who recite this idiotic canard. I love the way he lumps together skeptics with scientists, as if self-proclaimed YouTube skeptics have any sort of real-world accomplishments whatsoever. Or that it's impossible to prove that God doesn't exist. Hell, I even used to say this, but it's simply not true. You can prove a negative, and you can prove that God doesn't exist, depending on the definition of God. Oh, you cheeky bastard. This is You Can't Prove That God Doesn't Exist, debunked. No, well, the video is not titled You Can't Prove a Negative Debunked, even though that is the one claim he does effectively debunk. Now, if you're not familiar with rationality rules, the titles and thumbnails of his videos typically contain the name of some Christian argument with the word debunked slapped over it, because as we know, atheists have a near Pavlovian reaction to the word debunked. In this instance, however, the claim is one made by atheists, and the folk wisdom you can't prove a negative is just too near and dear to their hearts. Rationality rules will allow it in the case of disproving God, of course, but naturally he fails even to do that. First and foremost, a humongous and sincere thank you is in order. When I released my last video, titled A Likely Goodbye For Now, I of course knew that some of you would support me, but I in no way expected so many. I just want to say thank you. You've changed my life, and now hopefully together, we can change the lives of millions more. Yes, so go forth and spread the good words of atheism and determinism unto the millions, and preach to them that we're all just soulless meat machines who have no culpability for our own actions, and there is no right and wrong, and when we die, we just rot and spread this joyful wisdom unto the masses. I mean, after all, we spent the last 10 years trying to batter Christianity into submission and just look around us. I mean, everything's fucking coming up roses. To get to the topic at hand, it's widely believed that one can't prove a negative. That one can't, to name but a few examples, prove that Santa, unicorns, God, or Russell's celestial teapot doesn't exist. But this isn't necessarily true. Take Russell's teapot for example. If Russell was to assert that between Earth and Mars there is a microscopic teapot orbit in the Sun, then, in this case, it might well be impossible, or as good as impossible, to prove the negative. But if Russell was to also assert that the teapot is both entirely made of china and entirely made of steel, then we can prove the negative because this concept violates the law of non-contradiction which states that contradictory statements cannot both be true in the same sense and at the same time. Nothing can be made entirely of China and simultaneously entirely of steel. This isn't possible. And hence, by proving the negative, we can prove the non-existence of such a teapot. Which is precisely what Christian apologists have been telling you for years! Now, some will object to this by saying that we don't know, with absolute certainty, that nothing can violate the law of non-contradiction. To deny the law of non-contradiction is to allow that there could be mutually contradictory true propositions. According to the principle of explosion, this entails that every proposition be provable. If every proposition is equally provable, the entire project of rational argumentation disappears in a puff of logic. We don't have to wait for all the evidence to roll in before making this determination, which is another reason empiricism and scientism suck so much ass. But as we all know, atheists hate logic, and they hate rationality, because the mere existence of these things contradicts their blind materialist faith. But I would reply by saying that, with the exception of our own existence, we know absolutely nothing with absolute certainty. Are you... Absolutely certain about that? And so to demand that we have absolute certainty when proving a negative, but not absolute certainty when proving a positive, is unjustifiably inconsistent. And so, this objection doesn't stand. Now before I tie this to the various concepts of the Abrahamic God, 
I just want to point out two things. The first is that the reason why people say you can't prove a negative is actually to convey that the burden of proof is on those who make an assertion, and that those who dispute the assertion don't have a burden of disproof. And of course, this is true. And this is the very purpose of Russell's teapot. It illustrates the nature of the burden of proof. It doesn't illustrate that you can't prove a negative. And if a person asserts a negative, the burden lies on them to prove their negative and not on anyone else to disprove it, and they can't hide behind the alleged impossibility of proving a negative. Glad we're both on the same page. Now I really wish you would school the frothing atheist retards who've responded to my There Is No Evidence For God videos. Let's move on to the non-existent entity that is the Abrahamic God. Oh wow, did you see that? Let's look at that again in slow motion. <laughs> it's a crying baby! Do you get it? That's us, the Christians, because rationality rules here is going to destroy our precious illusions. <laughs> okay, seriously, dude. I'm going to blast your fucking moronic arguments to pieces, and all the butthurt is going to be of the atheist variety, and it's all going to be down here in my comments section. And uh, for you atheists, be sure to make your displeasure known by smashing that thumbs down icon. Over the thousands of years since its inception, there have been countless definitions asserted for this entity, some of which insisting that it's a white man who physically manifests above the clouds. Uh, citation please? And others that it's three entities rather than one, who all care deeply about who you sleep with and in what position. But the most popular definitions, at least today, are one, a transcendent and eternal being who created absolutely everything, which is actually a definition of the deistic god not the Abrahamic God. The characteristics of the Christian God include being transcendent, timeless, and the creator of absolutely everything. These characteristics are all affirmed, at the very least, by the Roman Catholic Catechism. And two, a transcendent and eternal being who created absolutely everything, who's omnipotent, meaning that it has unlimited power, omniscient, meaning that it has unlimited knowledge, omnipresent, meaning that it's everywhere at all times, and omnibenevolent, meaning that it's all-loving and infinitely good. Oh, and it's worth noting that many theists additionally define this being to be just, merciful, and responsible for imbuing mankind with free will. Now admittedly, the first definition can't be proven false, because, like the existence of an intangible, invisible, and undetectable celestial teapot, one would need unavailable, and perhaps even impossible resources and knowledge to do so. But the second definition can be proven false, and we can do so by demonstrating that one or more of its attributes are internally contradictory, that one or more of its attributes contradict a law of four, or that two or more of its attributes contradict one another. And so, let's name but just a few of these contradictions, starting with omnipotence. As observed by the 12th century polymath Averroes, one can prove that the very concept of omnipotence is self-contradictory by asking the simple question, can an omnipotent being create a stone so heavy that it cannot lift it? If the answer is yes, then the being's power is limited, because it cannot lift the stone. Uh, no, the being's power would not be limited until it chooses to create such an unliftable stone. That's really the first problem of the omnipotence paradox. Even if we ignore everything else that's wrong with it, there is no paradox if the omnipotent being simply chooses not to create such an unliftable stone in the first place. But if the answer is no, then the being's power is limited, because it cannot create the stone. And hence, an omnipotent being cannot exist. Whether you answer yes or no to the omnipotence paradox, you are assenting to a contradictory set of premises loaded into the question itself. Those premises are that a. An omnipotent being can do anything, and that b. A stone can be too heavy for an omnipotent being to lift. When your premises are contradictory, anything you deduce from those premises is going to be nonsense. God can create a stone of any weight, and God can lift a stone of any weight, so the concept of a stone being too heavy for God to lift is unintelligible, since the weight of a stone has no bearing on God's ability to lift it. The correct response to the omnipotence paradox is not to say yes or no, but to reject the question entirely as being nonsensical. Now it's worth noting that while this crushes the most popular definition of omnipotence, 
It doesn't crush all definitions, but that's a rabbit hole we'll dive down at a further date. Moving on, let's now look at just some of the attributes that contradict one another. First off, if a being is omnipotent, then it's necessarily already omniscient and omnipresent, because it must already know everything and be everywhere in order to have unlimited power. Uh, no, you just pulled that out of your ass because it sounded good to you. And so saying God is omnipotent, omniscient and omnipresent is like saying that the sea contains water, hydrogen and oxygen. Considering that hydrogen and oxygen are constituents of water, one might as well say the sea contains water. Now sure, this isn't so much of a game-ending flaw, but it certainly demonstrates that theists tend not to understand the nature of these concepts. The nature of these concepts that you just pulled out of your ass! A contradiction that is a game-ending flaw, however, is the combination of omniscience and human free will. Because if a being has unlimited knowledge, omniscience, then it knows all things, including the future. But if the future is known, then free will, the ability to consciously do otherwise, isn't possible. Uh, no, because God's timeless knowledge is contingent on our freely chosen actions. Our actions are not determined by God's foreknowledge. You have cause and effect in completely the wrong order. And finally, let's look at two omni-attributes that are incompatible with reality that being omnipotence and omnibenevolence. If a being existed with these attributes, then it would necessarily create the best possible universe, because it has unlimited power, omnipotence, and it's infinitely good, omnibenevolence. So why must an omnibenevolent being necessarily create a universe without suffering? Is there an argument behind this assertion? But one can easily think of a universe that's better than this one. For example, one in which innocent babies aren't born with cancer. Uh, real original, dude. Bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? Are you guys capable of having one original thought? In any case, go up to any of those children who are dying of cancer and ask them if they'd rather be non-existent. Ask them if they think the world is as ugly and terrible a place as atheists insist. It seems that all the atheists who sit in their armchairs, waving their tiny fists at the injustice of a god who would allow such suffering in the world, all do so from a perch of luxury and privilege. Why do you go out there with the world's missionaries and actually work to reduce the world's suffering, rather than sitting at home and trying to use it as an ideological pawn? Or to put it another way, and to expand upon a quote from the ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus. Ugh, here we go. Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Now there's no two ways around this. If a being exists that is willing to prevent evil, that is omnibenevolent, but is not able, that is, does not have the power to do so, then this being is not omnipotent. Epicurus continues, is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Again, this sentence is logically valid. Uh, logical validity is not a property of sentences, it is a property of arguments. It just goes to show that you really have no clue what logic even is. So is there an argument why an omnibenevolent god must create a universe without suffering? Because to me, this just seems like an assertion. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? And again, this sentence is logically valid. That's two questions! That wouldn't even be the conclusion of an argument! You really have no clue what logical validity is! So, to recap, even though the burden of proof is on the one who makes an assertion, in many cases you can prove the negative, even though you don't have the burden to do so. <laughs> what? Where did that come from? You know, you get one thing right and then you immediately fumble the ball. If you make a negative claim, you have the burden of proof to prove your negative claim. And you can't hide behind the alleged impossibility of proving a negative. And even if proving a negative were impossible, that does not give you license to make unprovable negative claims as atheists insist on doing. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.